thank you for coming uh, for the meet today. Uh, so, uh, we'll be focusing on uh, genetics and uh, diabetes research update today. Uh, we thank you very much uh, for uh, Professor Vasim Hanif, uh, Professor Rocky Sahai, Dr. Sudhakar Rao, Dr. Vishnu Priya Rao for joining us and chairing the session today. Uh, Idea Clinics, uh, as you are aware, is mainly focused on preventive health care and uh, uh, there's uh, mainly focusing on diabetes and other communicable diseases. So, uh, Idea Clinics, as you are aware, has uh, pioneered a predictive model of health care. Uh, mainly uh, <clears throat> promoting uh, the healthcare with human touch and uh, combined with the technology. Uh, with hybrid omnichannel platforms and cutting edge technology is integrating healthcare uh, in, with a vision to reduce burden of these preventive uh, conditions. And um, Idea Clinics is positioning itself uh, with a unique model in healthcare outside the hospitals across India. And uh, we are trying to achieve right balance of technology with process automation supported by human interfaces from specialist doctors. Uh, we have several verticals uh, that includes uh, uh, main idea clinics supported by idea pharmacy, idea skills, and idea health tech. We are trying to pioneer into the latest technological advances uh, that will help uh, better application of healthcare uh, in, in patients, especially with metabolic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, and among others. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, with this, um, I welcome uh, Professor Vasim Hanif, and uh, we thank you very much for joining our session today. I, um, <clears throat> As we know, professor, he's a professor in diabetes and endocrinology and consultant physician uh, and head of services of diabetes at uh, <coughs> University Hospital Birmingham. He's also honorary professor of medicine at University of Warwick. Yeah. Yeah. He is involved in several international projects that include IDF, uh, Strategy for Commonwealth to Guide Ministers at UN Summit, Chair International Advisory Board of Ornate Project of MRC UK, Foreign and Common Health Scientific Trade Delegate and Committee to India. Um, he is involved in, he is a board member of Centre for Diabetes and Endocrine Metabolism, University of Birmingham and Clinical Advisory Group, Lead for Research in Diabetes and Endocrinology at Institute of uh, Translation Medicine, Birmingham. Uh, his research in include several topics, including diabetes kidney disease, diabetes prevention, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and management of diabetes and Ramadan obesity, and tackling health inequalities. His well-known authority is on real-world evidence, uh, working on big data with dedicated bioinformatics team. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, I now introduce uh, Professor uh, Rakesh Sahai uh, to join us. Um, yeah. <laughs> We welcome Dr. Sudhakar Rao um, to join us as a chairperson today. Uh, please uh, come to the dais, sir. Um, as we know, uh, Professor has, uh, sorry, Dr. Sudhakar Rao has an experience of 33 years in the field of endocrinology. Uh, has uh, did in uh, endocrinology in uh, postgraduate institute of medical research in 1984. He is a member of IMA. His area of expertise include uh, diabetes management, uh, thyroid management, bioidentical hormone therapies for men and women, and goiter treatment. Th thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Uh, now I welcome Dr. Vishnu Priya Rao Paturi uh, to the podium. Uh, Dr. P. V. Rao is the co. Sir, please come in, sir. <laughs> he is the co-founder and director of Diabetomimics Operation in India and Asia. He, he was previously professor and chief of endocrinology at Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences. And Dr. P. V. Rao established the Research Society for the Study of Diabetes in India, RSSDI, and served as secretary from 1993 to 2007. A warm welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, we will move on. Uh, sir, you, you would like to join us, sir? And I say, <laughs> thank you very much, sir. <laughs> So, uh, we warmly welcome Professor uh, Rakesh Sahai uh, for chairing this session today. Uh, as we know, he is Joint Secretary of RSSDI, AIRO, former Secretary, Endocrine Society of India, Founder Secretary, South Asian Federation of Endocrine Societies, former Chairman of the AP Chapter of RSSDI and Hyderabad Chapter of API. 
He's also associate editor of Indian, Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, fellowship of the American College of Endocrinology in 2009, and fellowship of RSSDI in 2015. He's also fellowship of Indian College of Physicians in 2006, and the fellowship of Indian Academy of Clinical Medicine in 2008. Uh, he has over 100 publications in various national and international journals. Uh, a very warm welcome, sir. Uh, with this, uh, we'll uh, move forward to uh, our talks today. Uh, so uh, I invite Professor Wasim Hanif uh, to give his talk on the practical review of C-peptide testing in diabetes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, thank Sham Kalvapalli. We were colleagues in uh, UK for his kind invite. Whenever I come to Hyderabad, Sham always gets me a chance to speak. So thank you very much and thank you very much Rakesh. We've been together in Nizams and it's my great honor that I'm actually speaking before what I would call my guru of diabetes, Professor P. V. Rao. I and Rakesh were his students. Uh, so Namaskaram sir. It's, uh, it's a great honor and privilege that you are uh, the chair where I'm speaking. I learned about diabetes my initial days uh, from you. Uh, so Today, when uh, Sham actually suggested what we should be talking about, I was, talking, I was thinking about a lot of topics, but this is an area that has particularly interested me. We have done a lot of work, and uh, today in my talk, I would like to, <coughs> to, to kind of uh, acknowledge two, two people who worked with me clo closely. One is Dr. Shrikant Bilari. I think he was Rakesh's classmate from Usmania, who is now one of our colleagues and senior lecturer in Birmingham. He has done some of his work. And the other one is Dr. Shivani Mishra. Uh, she is also a young, upcoming uh, senior lecturer at Imperium. Uh, so some of the work that I'm presenting today has been done by them. The reason the C-peptide and insulin have actually started fascinating a lot of people was I remember a conversation I had uh, with, uh, when I was training in Birmingham with Professor Mike Shepard. Professor Mike Shepard is considered to be a doyon of endocrinology internationally. And I asked Professor Shepard, I said to him, you know, somehow when you come to the endocrinologist and diabetologist, why do the endocrinologist have a bit of an attitude and always think diabetologist to be a bit lower? Because my interest was in diabetes. And he was a quite a, if you have met uh, Mike Shepard, he's a quite a exuberant South African uh, person. And he said, diabetologists, how can they be endocrinologists? Because they don't measure their hormones. And, uh, and he was absolutely right. As diabetologists, we don't measure insulin and C-peptide. And he said, they are the only endocrinologists who don't measure their own hormones be it, you know, thyroid specialist, uh, be it adrenal specialist, everybody measures their hormone. And we've always relied on a surrogate marker of glucose to try and treat diabetes. The second big issue that has happened, and this is something which is very important, is that a lot of work and research, mostly led by the industry, has gone into the treatment of diabetes. So which technically means that all diabetes we have classified into type 1, type 2, and basically we start giving them medications. We really don't spend time to really diagnose what is the type of diabetes, and a lot of work has not been done in terms of establishing a diagnosis of diabetes. Just a glucose of more than 120 or what we say, more than 7, classifies as you, as you, uh, as you have diabetes. And over a number of years, we have started feeling that the patients we picked up as type 2 diabetes turned out to be something, something, something else. <coughs> so as we all know, this is the 100th year of uh, insulin discovery. Insulin was a fascinating discovery, and, and, and you know we still owe it to these four people for giving us insulin that really transformed the care of people with diabetes. As I said to you, this has been a therapeutic development. And since the development of diabetes, we have seen a plethora of medications coming in, starting from 
the animal insulins to the GLP-1 analogs uh, to GLP-GIP combinations, and they have all been used in terms of treating diabetes. And this is this is great news for 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 our patients. But when it comes to establishing diabetes and looking at the diagnosing diabetes, there's not been much in terms of development. And today I'm going to go and take you back to the basics, talking about the basics of diabetes and discussing a couple of our cases. So let's go back to the basics. So basically, diabetes, as we know, has got two big components to it. One is, is it monogenic and polygenic? Monogenic diabetes is, 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 is what we now call MODI. And it's, you're born with it and always going to develop diabetes. A lot of work on MODI diabetes was done by, by Andrew Hattersley, who was my colleague. Uh, we, we trained together in Birmingham, and now he's considered to be a, a world authority. Most of the research on MODI comes from him, from Exeter. When I actually was working with Andrew Hattersley, so we were both research fellows for Tony Barnett. So he gave him the monogenic diabetes and he named the name and he gave me polygenic diabetes research, just type 2 diabetes. I was very excited about it, but now 15, 20 years down the line, I think I've wasted my life because nothing, nothing came out of it and I'll tell you why. So polygenic diabetes is a polymorphism which increases the risk of diabetes and you're not born with it but high risk and may develop later depending on other factors. And the other factors is, is it genetics or environment is always, is always a big question. Is it the lifestyle that causes diabetes or is it the genetics? And this you're talking about type 2. The way I look at, at now after all this work is you know, you can have a low genetic risk, but if you've got strong environmental factors, as we are seeing in certain Western populations in which, because of a Western lifestyle, very, very little physical activity, a lot of obesity, we are seeing it. We see a lot of it in the, in the, in the United States. Second is the high genetic risk plus weak environmental factors. This is something we tend to see mostly in a South Indian uh, uh, context. A lot of work done by Professor Mohan looks at people who are not who are not really big, who are not obese, and they still tend to develop uh, develop, diabe uh, develop diabetes. And then we have got this high genetic risk for strong environmental factors. We see it, it in uh, Arab countries in the in the Middle East in the Middle East where we where you're talking about prevalence rates of nearly 50 to 60 percent, where there is a high genetic risk plus strong environmental factors, which is driving type 2 diabetes. And then we have got the low genetic risk plus weak environmental factors. This we see in the higher echelons of the society in the West, what we call the royal family kind of uh, thing, where hardly there is any diabetes. They don't have any risk factors. They have got a very healthy lifestyle. Everybody is biking and hardly eating anything or eating a very low carb diet and the prevalence of diabetes is, 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 is low. So this is the whole spectrum of what we call the, 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 the interaction between genetics or polygenic uh, uh, involvement along with environment. So what happens when we look at the, at the at type 2 diabetes in genetics? So this is the part of the what we call the GVAS, the genome-wide association studies. In the initial bit of my career, we did a lot of things to try and identify any genes that would cause an increased risk of type 2 diabetes in a South Asian cohort. And we had comparisons between the white population and the South Asian population. And this uh, was some of the work we did with uh, Jasper Kuna, we published in Nature. And this is what we found, that people with type 2 diabetes and people without type 2 diabetes, there are nucleotide changes present in type 2 diabetes groups, but not controls. But it is very difficult to assess effect size. And it is not the ethnicity that actually drives this, this, this nucleotide uh, change. Yeah. And if you are into genetics, if you want to really understand uh, um, this, because I worked with a lot of scientists, what you will find is that there will be a lot of established locus, novel locus, 
additional district signal but if you actually look at the effect size it is quite a wide distribution and it's very difficult to identify whether a particular nucleotide or chain is actually uh, driving it. There might be better work, better genetic techniques which will help to identify it, but currently it is, it is, it is quite a big, 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 big challenge. The monogenic diabetes is much more simpler because these are single gene mutations and you can actually identify it. The one that has been studied the most and is probably the best is MODI, which is the maturity onset diabetes of the young, which is a sing single gene defect causing diabetes. And then we have got neonatal diabetes, which is diabetes diagnosed less than six months of age, again linked to genetics. And they are the mitochondrial diabetes, which is diabetes and deafness or other mitochondrial syndromes. Now let us look at Modi and especially look at Modi uh, in the South Asian context and this is some of the work of Shimani and Shri. Now Modi actually accounts for only 2 to 4 percent of diabetes diagnosed less than 30 years and this is in all populations. Most of the cases are missing because they are classified as type 2 diabetes and are not picked up. There are lots of benefits of identification of Modi because then you can target the treatment depending on affected gene and do effective genetic counseling. And then you can do cascades testing in the families. And then there is prediction and screening of multi-system features. If you look at the prevalence of Modi, and this is the My Diabetes study from Exeter, and what it actually shows is that the pickup rate in the white British population is about 29% when you do molecular genetic testing. In the South Asian population, the pickup rate is only 12%. And this is highly statistically significant. So this implies two things. One is either the prevalence of Modi is very less in a South Asian population, or more importantly, the young onset of type 2 diabetes, which we're going to be talking about, there is a high prevalence of young onset type 2 diabetes in a South Asian population because of double gene dose effect coming from both parents having diabetes and other factors. And therefore, the prevalence rate appears to be, to be, to be, to be low. And this is something that is being, 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 being looked at. You must all be aware of these mutations. Every time you look up, there's a new a paper from Exeter identifying a new mutation for, 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 for Modi. But these are probably the most identified mutations. And it's very important to identify a specific mutations because the treatment of it actually, uh, actually differs. So if you look at HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha mutations, which are quite common, these can be treated by low dose one daily sulfonylureas. Glucokinase mutations do not require any treatment. Most of the time, the blood glucose levels are slightly elevated, and, they, and the complications of diabetes do not occur in this uh, group, of, group, of, group of patients. The beta cell transcription factor mutations, these require insulin and perhaps even pancreatic enzyme replacement. And this, uh, they behave more aggressively, more like type 1 diabetes in terms of their uh, complications. And then you have got the ATP-sensitive beta cell potassium channel mutations. These need treatment with high-dose sulfonylureas usually three times, uh, three times a day. So therefore, it's not only important to identify MODI, but it's it important to identify the type of MODI by which you can actually direct uh, the treatment. This is where the whole concept of precision medicine is, is, is developing. Now before we start talking about C-peptide, let's look at the other genetic um, 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 uh, characteristics of, of, of diabetes, especially in young. This is more of a pediatric area, but again, it's very important for us to do it. You must have all heard about it. This is more common in pediatrics about neonatal diabetes mellitus. This can either be transient or it can be permanent. NDM is antibody negative. It's insulin sensitive hyperglycemia during the first six months of life. Type 1 diabetes does not develop in the first six months of life. So if uh, 
baby has diabetes at birth, it is usually neonatal diabetes mellitus. 10% of the uh, patients have got uh, syndromes like the pancreatic aplasia and the various genetic possibilities identified and various genetic mutations are there. The commonest in, is in the sulfonylurea receptor. <coughs> Modi, as I said to you, it's characterized by if it's NH HNF1 alpha, it's glycosuria, and if it's glucokinase gestation, it's more like gestational, uh, gestational uh, diabetes. So when do we suspect Modi, and what are the criteria for actually testing patients for Modi? The first one is the onset should be less than 25 years. Most of the patients with Modi would present before 25 years. There should be an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, which means only one parent should be involved in having the diabetes. If both parents are involved, it is very unlikely that it is Modi, and this is where in a South Asian and an Indian context where things get wrong. So it is an autosomal dominant of inheritance. It is usually can be controlled without insulin. This is to differentiate it from type 1 diabetes for the first five years. And depending upon the mutation, insulin may be required later. It's an autoimmune response to beta cells leads to decreased insulin secretion. And I have mentioned the most common gene codes, um, gene codes uh, involved. And some of them can be required, like glucokinase require no treatment while the HNF1 alpha and 4 alpha require sulfonylureas, while the potassium ADPase mutations require insulin. So in terms of implementing personalized care for Modi, it is important to identify if it's HNF1 alpha, 4 alpha, 1 beta respond to low dose sulfonylureas, and 1 beta requires insulin for treatment, Glucokinase does not require any treatment. Then there is all this condition called congenital hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. In this, the hypoglycemia develops just after birth in first few months of life. And hypoglycemia could be severe, debilitating and persistent, and there are definitive mutations. Some patients respond to disoxin, but some may require uh, uh, subtotal uh, pancreatectomy. There is a megaloblastic anemia which responds well to thymine and they can develop monogenic autoimmune sy uh, syndromes. So this was just an overview of the various genetic types of diabetes that are there. Now today now I'm going to focus on what we call young onset type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes and what are the current challenges of identifying these patients correctly and trying to treat them. So when you look at the young onset type 2 diabetes, this is defined as under 30 years, in some cases under 45 years. The prevalence rate is rising across the globe, especially in the UK and the US, in the uh, minority communities, mostly South Asians and uh, Africa, uh, African uh, Caribbeans. There is a faster progression to insulin compared to older onset type 2 diabetes. And now there is a lot of data coming in, especially both from the US and the UK, and there's a recent publication from a group showing that these patients have got worse clinical outcomes than when compared to people with type 1 diabetes. So young onset type 2 diabetes patients actually do much worse than type 1 diabetes patients. And it's disproportionately affecting the people of the South Asian ethnicity. And this is uh, quite a big challenge as to how we identify and treat them uh, correctly. So therefore, we need a correct diagnosing tool at the, time of, at the time of diagnosis. Now let's take an example of a 29 year old man and we are seeing a number of these patients, I'm sure you are seeing it in your practice, who comes with a glucose of 18. So I'm using, um, sorry, this is a UK presentation. So it's got the UK units is always divided by, multiplied by 18 complaining of osmotic symptoms. The question is whether the patient has got type 1 diabetes, then they will require insulin injection, insulin pump, self-monitoring, education, carbohydrate, quantity, extra, extra, along with uh, legal implications. It's type 2 diabetes, where you have to talk about lifestyle, tablets, uh, 
uh, and does not require routine glucose in, uh, uh, testing. Or it could be another type of diabetes, be it Modi, uh, be it um, uh, type 3C, and this may require insulin tablets or nothing. I'm going to use an example of one of my patients who actually presented in our clinic and try and take you through this patient's journey and try to explain about, about, about things a bit more clearly. This was a 19-year-old female in college of Bangladeshi ethnicity. Her BMI was 23, which means she was not very obese. She complained of two weeks of tiredness, polyuria, and thirst. Mother has type 2 diabetes and is on insulin. Mother checked the capillary blood glucose at home and it was 18. The first question we need to ask ourselves, what blood test might help to classify her diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2? We can do the ketone testing, but that doesn't really help. And this is where the whole story of the C-peptide and the focus on C-peptide comes back. So let us go back and revisit about what is C-peptide. So we know that the pancreas actually secretes insulin in a pro-insulin form. And just before the release, the insulin is cleaved and the C-peptide is released. The reason why pro-insulin, uh, the, the, the pancreas stores insulin in a pro-insulin form is to prevent hypoglycemia. So it's a cleavage pro product of pro-insulin. The advantages of uh, C-peptide when compared to insulin measurement is insulin, the moment it's secreted, it actually goes in intracellularly and it's very unstable. If you speak to any biochemist, they will tell you the insulin assays are very noisy and very difficult to measure. When compared to it, the C-peptide has a longer half-life. It's more stable than insulin and it does not have a first pass metabolism, so it can actually last longer. And now it is considered to be an established marker of beta cell function. <clears throat> Along with it, we have got pancreatic autoantibodies. The pancreatic antibodies that we have is the GAD antibodies or GAD65, Islet antigen or IA2 and zinc transporter 8. These are the three we tend to measure. We, we, don't, we are no longer measuring uh, what used to be called as the islet cell antibody. These are primarily studied in research setting to predict the onset of type 1 diabetes. The role in the classification of diabetes is unclear and I'll explain why. One of the, the caveats that we have to do when we are interpreting the antibodies is the first thing Antibody negative does not exclude type 1 diabetes. It's less than complete testing. And people from some ethnicity, and this is again our work in a South Asian context showing, have lower rates of positivity. And titers di diminish over, 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 a period of, over a period of time. So what is the best practice for testing antibodies? The first question you have to ask yourself is, what's the clinical question? Antibodies should only be measured to support a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and not, not otherwise. And then again, we all need to remember type 1 diabetes is not excluded if the antibodies are negative. So if the clinical suspicion of type 1 diabetes is high, then do not defer insulin. Please start insulin immediately. If the clinical suspicion is low, we need to be clear as to why we are measuring the antibodies and we need to have a clear question in mind. If the clinical suspicion is intermediate and antibodies are positive, these are supportive of type 1 diabetes diagnosis. Now we come to C-peptide. The first question we have to ask ourselves is what is normal uh, C-peptide and I'm going to go through some of the algorithms that have been developed. The challenge of C-peptide is that the no normal ranges have yet been defined. It's not robustly evaluated cutoff that delineates one type from the other, although there have been some suggestions which I'm going to go through today. And it's not interpretable at the time of diagnosis. It, if anything, it, it causes a bit of, bit, of, bit of confusion. 
So now coming back to my case, the question is what treatment should she be started on? The first question is we don't want to miss the type 1 diabetes and delay insulin while waiting specialist uh, test. She's young, she's not overweight, she's a UK born to Asian people appear to have similar risk of type 1 diabetes. And sometimes diabetes classification takes time beyond the results of immediate specialist test. And I would like to hear from uh, Professor Rao about how we can get this much quicker. So this patient was started on a type 1 diabetes regime with uh, Levamir, BD insulin, and Novorapids. Three weeks later, <coughs> we got the antibodies, <coughs> which were negative for GAT65, IA2, and ZNT8. The question is, would you re evaluate your diagnosis now? It is possible that this patient has got antibody negative type 1 and needs to see how it evolves and C peptide will help further down the line. This could be monogenic diabetes if the family is compelling and could proceed to genetic testing or is it early onset of type 2 diabetes. So the question really is, and this is where we are going to do is, how we stratify diabetes currently. So if there is a new presentation of hyperglycemia, especially in a young person, less than 30 years or less than 25 years, the first question we have to ask ourselves, is this Modi? And we need to have a clinical suspicion of Modi. And if the patient fits the criteria for Modi, we should try and do the genetic testing. The second question is whether the patient has got type 1 diabetes, especially if the patient doesn't present with diabetic ketoacidosis and you're thinking about diagnosis. This is where the testing for the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the GAD, IA2, and zinc transport antibodies becomes important. At the same time, looking for C-peptide to, to give us some idea about the diagnosis. The third is whether this is pancreatic type 3 C diabetes. Now, this is something that, that the world has suddenly woken up to. When I was actually training in India about 20, 25 years ago, there was the whole concept of the malnutrition-related diabetes, and there was a lot of push to have malnutrition-related diabetes in the WHO and the idea of classification, but it was rejected, as most people thought that this was, this was not happening. But pancreatic type 3C is revisiting the malnutrition-related diabetes because this involves anything that involves the pancreas, so things like pancreatitis, things like exocrine dysfunction of the pancreas, and in some people, uh, and these are the reports coming mostly from Africa now where, where you're seeing this and the treatment of pancreatic type 3C is, 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 is turning out to be different. And if we are able to exclude all these things, especially in young patients, then we proceed to type 2 diabetes. So currently type 2 diabetes is the diagnosis of exclusion. So what we really need to look at, and this is one of the things that we have to really change is, in a young person, the moment they come with blood glucose, sending them home with metformin is not the option. One of the things that we are trying to do in the UK and perhaps across globally is in young people, type 2 or diabetes should be diagnosed by a specialist, a diabetologist, and a chronologist, and not by the family physician. Because in a family physician, and, and, and there could be loads of cases, uh, there's one example I've given, the, the concept is that if you're not in DK, so they check your blood glucose levels, it may be 25, they dip your urine, there's no ketones, and you classify that as type 2 diabetes, and all these diagnoses are missed. And therefore, it's very important for us to all realize that diabetes, especially in young, can be, can be many, many things than, than, than type, two, type 2 diabetes. So this is where I use the concept of buckets. So who's in the type 2 diabetes bucket? Oh, sorry. So who's in the type 2 diabetes buckets? So along with people with type 2 diabetes, they are the genetic and type 1 diabetes who, are, who are, were not ketotic at the time of presentation. So these are the ones that have been misdiagnosed with other types of diabetes. These are the ones what I call the bona fide type 2 diabetes where we don't have to any, do anything. And this is where all the research of type 2 diabetes and the guidelines of type 2 diabetes have come from. So usually these are white Europeans who are overweight or obese. 
they are middle-aged or older at the onset. And uh, if you look at ethnic minority groups, uh, usually South Asians, they're much more. So these are bona fide type 2 diabetes you don't have to be worried about. Then there is this whole concept of atypical type 2 diabetes. So people who are different in some ways, but don't have other types of diabetes. So this could be thin diabetes, this could be uh, type 3C diabetes. These are all put in the, in the same bucket. And therefore, it's very important to, 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 to identify. So when we talk about atypical type 2 diabetes, what are we talking about? So type 2 diabetes that does not fit the expected mole. But the important thing is the mole has been defined on historical features, predominantly in white European population. And this is something which I'm very, very passionate about. All the guidelines that we have got, when we say SGLT2 inhibitors are the first line or the GLP-1 analogs should be given to everybody who has got a blood glucose level going slightly up. If you look at the studies, this was an analysis I and uh, Professor Kunti, Kamlesh Kunti did. And we put all the cardiovascular outcome trials that have founded the guidelines. And these are the guidelines that are ta talked about across the globe, including in India. And if you look at the number of Indian population in it, it's hardly less than 5%. In some trials, there is no Indian or even Asian populations. So these are white European trials. So why are these different? So one of the things when you raise it with the regulators in the UK and even in the US, <coughs> they say all humans are the same. So what is the difference? Now, the example I give to them is the direct study. So this was done by a very good friend, Roy Taylor. I was in the Diabetes UK research committee that gave them five million pounds to do direct study. And direct study was very simple. You give the patients 800 kilocalorie diets, make them lose 10 to 15 kilograms in weight, BMI 45, in 85% of the patients, diabetes disappear, and this is called diabetes remission. And this was propagated globally. There have been a number of conferences in India. I've seen speakers, excellent speakers, both from India. Roy Taylor has been here several times, talked about direct study. And I said, and I challenged uh, uh, Roy Taylor, and basically told him, if I've got an Asian patient, which I've got lots in Birmingham, and if his BMI is 25, how much weight do you want him to lose? He's going to disappear. But, uh, but what was interesting was there was the National Diabetes Audit, which so now the direct study has been implemented across the UK as a part of the Di NHS Diabetes Remission Program. When they did that, in the original direct study, 99.9% .9 of the population was white European suburban. When they implemented and measured it after two years, this is again published in Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology by Jonathan Vallabhji, what it actually showed was the acceptance rate was only 10%. And in the Asian population of the UK, it was only 2%, just reflecting what was there in the trial. So therefore, all these clinical trials should reflect the population they do it. Also, we need to start accepting that the early onset type 2 diabetes is actually normal as an, as an Indian subgroup. And therefore, the approaches that we take in this population needs to, be, needs, to be, needs to be different. So coming back to the case where I started, we measured the C-peptide. I'm going to show you about how we interpret the C-peptide. Came back as greater than 1,000. Uh, HbA1c was 48. We did Modi genetic testing. There was no known mutations for Modi genes identified. The patient remains on basal insulin, but with no plans to introduce oral. Her BMI is 23, and we have classified her as atypical early onset uh, diabetes. So what is early onset type 2 diabetes? First is the diagnosis should be less than 40 years. Could be type 2 diabetes, but the chances of type 1 diabetes in Modi are much higher compared to later onset diabetes and should always be considered and excluded. Clinical due negligence, could it be type 1 diabetes or Modi, can be overweight and have type 1 diabetes, specialist tests are available, and early onset type 2 diabetes, extremely high risk state because these patients have to be treated aggressively, so we have to have a clarity about the diagnosis. So in terms of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in young adults, there is no test that's 100% accurately diagnosed diabetes subtypes. 
Some of the blood tests may be supportive, but not accurate on all of the time or validated. Age and body mass index are the two factors most likely to influence diabetes diagnosis, especially type 2 diabetes. Age and BMI are increasingly becoming poor at discriminating the diabetes subtypes. So this is a chart that actually I try to put this concept of textbook versus real life as to what we see. So the two factors that are driving the diabetes is one is increasing age. We know as we get all older, we get fatter, our pancreas start getting weaker, and we develop diabetes. There have been, uh, I've seen papers from India showing that 60% of the population in Delhi above the age of 65 has diabetes. So age is an important factor. Uh, the second one is the BMI. As we all get fatter, the risk of developing diabetes increases. Typically up there is type 2 diabetes. Having occurring in populations with increasing BMI and increasing age. The type 1 diabetes, as it is classically described and, 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 and we have learned it from the textbook, is a disease of 10 people at a young age. But we, now what we are really seeing is the type 1 diabetes even presenting at an older age. We are seeing in 40s, 50s or even 60s presenting with type 1 diabetes and some of it could be type 3C diabetes but we are seeing an increasing prevalence of type 1 diabetes. Similarly, type 2 diabetes, as in my case in the 20s and 30s, we are seeing in obese and even in non-obese individuals who are developing uh, type, 2, type 2 diabetes. So we need to start considering two t things. One is type 2 diabetes in lean people, which is not type 1 diabetes, and this is something of a challenge. And the second is the young onset type 2 diabetes occurring in obese, obese, obese in individuals. So why is the classification hard and therefore requires more specialist input? So we've got a small pool of type 1 diabetes, a large pool of type 2 diabetes, and we've got the others. But what we're now seeing is all of them coming, to, coming together, and a lot of other factors are affecting. So you've got adult onset type 1 diabetes, preserved insulin secretion in type 1 diabetes, therefore it behaves like type 2 diabetes, and the patients don't develop DKA. Then you have got type 2 diabetes in lean people, which can be confused with type 1 diabetes. Then you have got ketosis-prone type 2 diabetes. This is what we saw a lot during the COVID pandemic, where the prevalence of DKA in our patients with type 2 diabetes was increased by nearly fivefold. Then you have got young onset type 2 diabetes. And then there are factors like ethnicity, genes uh, coming into play. So what is becoming more and more important now is to have a better classification of diabetes and a specialist input at the time of di uh, diagnosis. The main factors helping to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 still remain mostly the same, younger age, lower BMI, unintentional weight loss, ketoacidosis, glucose greater than 20 or 360, ketosis without acidosis, asthmatic symptoms, family history, history of autoimmune disease, are weak discriminators. <coughs> I've talked about <coughs> allied cell antibodies and these are kind of recommended. <coughs> now this is a flow chart that has been developed by ADAEST and was published in Diabetologia. And this basically flow chart helps us to look and classify, uh, I'm trying to see whether I can, uh, how we proceed. So you have got adults with suspected type 1 diabetes. You can test for the islet cell antibodies. If islet cell antibodies are positive, then it is probably type 1 diabetes. If the islet cell antibodies are negative, which can happen in 5 to 10% of pe people with type 1 diabetes, you look at age, if a whether the age is less than 35 years or greater than 35 years. If the age is less than 35 years, you look for any other features of monogenic diabetes like MODI, mitochondrial diabetes and the others. If it is no, then you start looking for any features of type 2 diabetes like strong family history, um, increased BMI. If there are features of monogenic diabetes, you test for C-peptide. If the test 
for C peptide is greater than 200. This is the measurement that is used. Then you look for genetic testing for monogenic diabetes. If it is less than 200, then you go down the type 1 diabetes route. If the there are no features for type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, then you look for, uh, then you go down the route of type 1 diabetes. If the features of uh, type 2 diabetes at the age is greater than fear, and if you are unclear of the classification, <coughs> make a clinical decision as to how the person with diabetes should be treated. Consider C peptide test at the time or after three years. If it is less than 200, then it is type 1 diabetes. If it is between 200 to 600, and now they are talking about it being 800, then it is indeterminate and you are not really sure. And if it's greater than 800, then it is home and dry with type 2 diabetes. Now this is a kind of a tool that I use in my clinical practice to try and guide me through, through, through the patients. All our patients in whom we are not sure about the diagnosis or the classification we said, get a C-peptide, get a insulin antibodies, and then if we think that they've got the features suggestive of monogenic diabetes, then we check for, for genetic testing for, 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 for MODI. Now, when you're looking for C-peptide, there are certain important factors that need to be taken into consideration. So the first is, the best time to really be able to interpret C-peptide is beyond three years after diagnosis. One thing you've got to remember is C-peptide all depends upon the glucose levels. So if the glucose levels are high, the C-peptide can be high. If the glucose levels are low, the C-peptide can be low. So the measurements usually should be done within five hours of eating is recommended. Again, whenever you measure C-peptide, make sure you measure the blood glucose levels. So if somebody is having a hyper blood glucose level of 3.9, then the C-peptide levels will be low and your interpretation will be wrong. So therefore, it's very important to measure the glucose concurrently. Persistent C-peptide levels of greater than 600 or 800, according to SEM, suggest type 2 diabetes. By following this thing, reclassification of diabetes happens in nearly 11% of the population. Urinary C-peptide was recommended, but currently we are not using it. We are using a blood or a serum C-peptide in terms, in terms of diagnosis. As I mentioned to you about genetic testing for neonatal diabetes, monogenic diabetes should be considered in those with one or more of the following features. Age of the diagnosis, less than 35 years, HbA1c, less than 58. One parent with diabetes and features of specific monogenic causes, be it renal cysts, partial lipodystrophy, maternal inherited deafness, Severe insulin resistance in the absence of obesity. And you have got the Modi probability calculator which you, if you Google, it's available. It's a fantastic tool where you can put in all the features and it gives you the risk of, uh, the risk of Modi. <coughs> While I've talked about a lot about type 1, type 2 and various type of diabetes, there is another question that we need to ask ourselves. Once we put down somebody as type 2 diabetes, is all type 2 diabetes same? Or are the features different? And this was a paper that was published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology a few years ago, which basically tried to classify type 2 di or all diabetes into five types. You must have seen, and this was mainly based on a database, and it was, it was it, 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 although they could be some uh, questions as to how, how good this paper was based on the Swedish data. But they started looking at features of type 2 diabetes in a different context and not putting everybody in what I call uh, the one bucket. And there was this um, another paper coming from Professor Mohan's group, which looked at it in a South Asian context. And they also came up with, with very interesting findings and they did a much more deeper analysis depending on the age of diagnosis, BMI, waist circumferences, glycated hemoglobin, 
triglyceride, HDL cholesterol, and C-peptide fasting levels and stimulated. And they identified four clusters. So I think now the time has come where we look at diabetes not as a single entity, but look into a deeper way. This is the only way we can give precision treatment to our patients and not start putting them on all on uh, what I can call SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, thank you very much. So, in summary, I would say diabetes has genetic basis and in coming years, our understanding has improved and continuing to get better. Diagnosing diabetes correctly will help us to target treatments and, 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 and provide better care to our patients. Measuring genetic mutations and C-peptide will help us in the classification along with new tools that are being developed and, uh, and, and the set of glucose toxicity, the whole thing, including complication, is, is, is going to be uh, an interesting area. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vasi, uh, Dr. Vasi. Uh, you have made it anybody, any doubt or classify any uh, comment? Yeah, so I think uh, I should uh, congratulate you for the excellent presentation. You brought out <clears throat> many important aspects about uh, uh, diabetes as we see it in our uh, country and I mean particularly with reference to the South Asian population that you deal with in Birmingham. <clears throat> so what we what we have been seeing, as you've been uh, as you rightly pointed out, we see today we see a lot of uh, young diabetics, I mean younger individuals developing diabetes, and who do not exactly fit into either of the two types of diabetes. I mean, the either type one or type two, and you know one of the classification. And 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 uh, towards this end, I found that the you know the WHO modified the classification in 2017, and they 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 put this big bucket of you know unclassified diabetes so so many of our patients actually younger patients fall into that category where they uh, don't have typical features of uh, type 1 diabetes they don't present with ketoacidosis but they have significantly high uh, high glucose levels they require insulin right from the uh, fr from the time of diagnosis of diabetes they are not managed with they cannot they cannot be controlled with oral anti diabetic medications and and they, but they don't go into ketoacidosis and uh, they have a high risk of complications also. So this is a group which is very intriguing and many, many times we, we uh, do not find the exact, uh, you know, label for them. So that's, that's, uh, that's important. Uh, a couple of questions I just wanted to ask you because you have been using the C-peptide uh, assay. So what I wanted to ask you is that what you, you have said clearly that you would like to do it in the postprandial phase post meal values <clears throat> would you do uh, stimulation tests uh, with uh, post prandial because they are described some of these uh, stimulation tests are described with glucagon stimulation and you know would, would you would you use them or would you just look at a mixed meal or yeah. you would like to give a standardized meal or something like that no thank you thank you rakesh for those uh, excellent questions so what has happened is that previously whenever we used to check c peptide the whole concept was very complicated. So we used to do insulin along with that as well, which has to go in an ice and in a very noisy assay. The C-peptide assays were very noisy, so some people used to just do it in a fasting state. Now what we realized along with lots of others is that we need a kind of a practical interpretation of the test. So when the patient usually come into the clinics, they usually are in a fed state, unless you have to bring them back in a fasting state, as we do for glucose. Because we hardly check fasting glucose now, we rely on HPA1C. So in terms of the pragmatic way of interpreting C-peptide was to do it post-meal. The reason why we started checking the glucose was that was a kind of a marker that would help us to interpret the C-peptide in a much better way. So when somebody is having a hypo, then their C-peptide levels will be low. It's similar to doing plasma and urine osmolality. So that, again, is a good marker for us to, to, to interpret it. Now, the SAs have got really better. So in the sense, once you do it, they are able to analyze and give you a much larger uh, thing. Now, for any of my these kind of patients that you have described, in which the unclassified bucket, I'm not sure, 
We tend to measure C-peptide on a regular basis at each of the clinic visits every six months or a year. And that gives us a kind of a graph as to what is happening to the C-peptide levels. And that is, again, is a much better measure in terms of uh, trying to interpret the result. A single C-peptide can go this way or that way, and sometimes it's confusing. Because even if you've got somebody, say, with type 1 diabetes, if they are in a honeymoon phase with some beta cells left, so C-peptide will be, will be high. So therefore, it's not the single, but it's the serial measurements that helps us in diagnosis. One, one quick question is, uh, would you like, I mean, uh, could you measure the insulin resistance also? I mean, is there any calculation for doing that with the C-peptide? No, currently, I think the insulin resistance, we, we tend to do it in some of patients, HOMA, but that's, that's very, that's again a, quite a detailed test. Some labs like Oxford have developed their own protocols. We've got our own protocols. We do it in some of the patients, especially after they have, say, had a pancreatic transplant or a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant, and if they put on weight and develop diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2. But using it in a clinical setting is, 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 is a bit of work. But I think we should be able to get on to uh, there. One of my main points here, and, and this is where... Uh, I feel it is very important for us to understand is, as we understand that these patients are complicated. So the ones that uh, we get into real difficulty with is not sometimes I cannot classify it or anyone else can classify it. But some of these patients actually present to the GPs or family care physicians. And again, I see it in India because, you know, I see a lot of patients here. These patients first go to, uh, you know, um, uh, not a, not a diabetologist or endocrinologist. And because most people think that, oh, they don't have ketoacidosis, so this is all type 2 diabetes. And then they started on metformin. So there's one patient I remember very clearly in the UK. So this was a 27-year-old boy of Asian heritage. He was South Indian. His BMI was about 27, 26. He went to the GP. The GP said, you know, check the ketones. There were no ketones started the patient on metformin. Uh, the patient went back to glucose, was still elevated out of three months, came to the doctor, and the doctor said, you know, you know, all this carbohydrate is the problem for you. So you stop the carbohydrate, go on a, what they call a keto diet, and started the patient on SGLT2 inhibitors. And within a week, he presented to the hospital in diabetic ketoacidosis with a pH of 6.9. We struggled to bring him back, and when we checked his antibodies and um, Alitzel, they were, they were positive. So he basically had something like LADA or latent autoimmune type 1 diabetes. And this is where the concern is that in young people, uh, I'm not sure we're going to miss out, but especially I'm, I'm really concerned about the way we are dishing out SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, you know, every time you go in, every person on the world will be on an SGLT inhibitor, I think. They've got a heart failure, renal failure, protects you. And this is a, a bit of a concern uh, that, especially with diabetes, it, you've got to get it right. Because as you know, uh, uh, dabagliflozin has been withdrawn globally because of the risk of DKA in type 1 diabetes. Uh, so therefore, if any of these patients are misclassified and the drugs like are used, then we will end up harming the patients more. Yeah, that's uh, young. Nice talk, uh, Asif. It's very interesting. Uh, C peptide as a molecule, is it limited only for a diagnostic tool or does it have any role in monitoring disease progression, predicting complications? Or uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question, Sham. I think C peptide is a very important measure. So, even in patients <coughs> who have got type 1 diabetes, the amount of C peptide level actually indicates the amount of control. So if you have got type 1 diabetes, but you've got about four or five beta cells working on you, producing C-peptide, then the risk of hypoglycemia, or severe hypoglycemia, I'm not talking about ordinary, severe hypoglycemia is much less. The, 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 the what they call time in target range is much better. So even in patients who are able to produce a little amount of C-peptide, the prognosis is actually much better, even in people with type 1 diabetes. So again, it is a marker for, for not only diagnosis, but also predicting the progression of the disease. Uh, 
anybody? A thank, I thank Dr. Vasim for making the C peptide importance of C peptide, and the oh, we have a big clap for the uh, speaker. <laughs> <laughs>